welcome to another edition of Bringing the Zoo to You. I'm Dr. Jennifer Watts, the Director of Nutrition. So today, unfortunately, we're not going to be looking at any animals, but we're going to be learning a lot about how I make diets for our animals. There's a lot of art to it, but there's a lot of science that goes into this and a lot of things that I have to consider that you may not have thought of before. So we're going to do a little presentation and then you can ask questions during it, we'll hopefully get to them, or you can wait until the end and we can take some more questions then. All right? Okay, so we're gonna be talking about the art and science of zoo nutrition. So very quickly, I have some of the components of nutrition, which are the same as what it is for humans. So we've got protein, fat, and carbohydrates, minerals, and vitamins. The vitamins that we're interested in are both fat soluble, which is the A, D, E, and K, and water soluble. And when I talk about minerals, we separate them into macro and micro minerals, and that doesn't mean how important they are, that just means how much needs to be in the diet. Macro minerals need to be in a percentage of the diet, and micro minerals are actually in a parts per million. So very small amounts, but they are very important nutrients. And this next slide kind of shows you all the relationships that go into zoo nutrition. I'm not going to talk about any of it, but just so that you get an idea of everything that we need to take into consideration when we're trying to feed our animals. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. When I do diet formulation, I have to take a lot of stuff into consideration. I have to look at what they eat in the wild. I have to look at what their gastrointestinal tract looks like. We're going to talk about some how we can use domestics to try to figure out what these animals need. And then as we get down to the individual animals, we have to talk about their health status, how they're managed, if there are any specific needs for that particular species, and then what foods we have available to actually feed them. So when we start, we start with free ranging and try to find information that researchers have collected uh, from the wild so we can get an idea of what they eat. In the past, we used to just get information that said they eat leaves and fruit. Well, that's interesting, but that doesn't tell us a lot. So when we worked with researchers, we said, can you give us about percentages of how much they eat? Because what we can do is, although we can't replicate what these animals actually eat in the wild, we can replicate the nutrients that they consume and use foods that are available to us to repl replicate those nutrients. So we can say if they ate 70% leaves and 30% fruits, they eat 15% protein, 65% fiber, and 0.7% calcium, just as an example. We can replicate this. We can't replicate their actual diet in the wild. Another thing we have to take into consideration are seasonal changes. Seeing a zebra in snow is not very natural, so we have to understand how their body reacts to that and what changes we have to make in our dietary protocol to affect that. On the other hand, we've got our bears, our brown bears, who go through huge seasonal diet changes. So we have to make sure that we take those into account and uh, make changes as it's needed. When we, started in, when we start evaluating the anatomy of animals, we have to remember that gastrointestinal tract starts in the mouth. That's where digestion actually starts. So the lip shape or how the animals apprehend their food, either whether it be a trunk, or their hands, or their lips, their tongue, all of that tells us information. So what you're looking at now is our black rhino, and a black rhino has that little triangular lip, which means that they pick leaves off of bushes and shrubs, which is very different from the white rhino, who has, if you can see, a very broad lip. These guys are grazers, so they're like giant lawn mowers, and they just eat lots and lots and lots of grass. So even though these species are related, they have very, very different dietary needs. And we have to make sure that we understand that because that is very important to their health. The other thing to take into consideration is their teeth. You can definitely see the difference between these two skulls and can tell that this animal over here is a grass eater, an herbivore, because they have very big molars and they have some small incisors that are used to clip grass. On the other hand, over here, you can definitely tell that that's a carnivore because of the large incisors and pointy molars that are not needed to grind up the meat that they eat. So we're gonna have a very, very quick anatomy lesson. 
we have several different types of gastrointestinal tracts in the different kinds of animals that tell us, that actually gives us a lot of information as to what these animals eat. So these are carnivores, or, or, or mostly carnivores, a little omnivore, but as you can see, like the dog here in the middle, you have a stomach, you have a straight tube, and then it goes out. So they have a very fast uh, uh, passage rate. They don't digest their food for very long because their food is very nutritious and they can break it down very easily. So they don't have to have a lot of time in their stomach or in their intestines to digest their food. On the other hand, animals that eat grasses have to have a lot of digestional adaptations to be able to break down the food because the major form of energy in grasses is in the form of cellulose. And cellulose, almost all animals cannot break that down. They need bacteria to be able to do it and time. So what ruminants did is they adjusted their stomach so that there's a four stomach. So this is, the, this is before their actual stomach, here's their actual stomach, and this is their rumen. So they take a lot of time of breaking down the cellulose in this rumen before it goes through the stomach and then really nothing happens in the large intestine. So this is one of the things, we call them four gut fermenters, and that's a ruminant. They do not have four stomachs. They actually have one stomach with four compartments. And this is just a little um, schematic to kind of show how cows and other ruminants eat. So they eat their food, if you follow the green line, it goes into their rumen, it mixes around in there, and then they regurgitate it, and that's this pink line. And that's when you see a cow chewing its cud. It's regurgitated some of the grasses to break them down into smaller pieces to allow the bacteria to have some more opportunity to break it down. So then they swallow it again, it gets redirected into their omasum, and then out to the stomach and the small intestine. I just think ruminants are really cool, um, so that's why I kind of focused on there. So this is, includes our, all of our bison, our antelope, reindeer, cows, all types of deer and things like that. So other animals kind of tried to figure this out, but they're a little bit different, and that includes the kangaroo, which is on the left, and you can see their esophagus there, and it curls around, and you see all these little saculations in there, and that's their way of trying to hold on to the food, the grass that they eat, longer to give it time to digest. And this is a colobus monkey. Colobus monkeys are really the only true leaf eaters of the primate kingdom. So they've adjusted their stomach to kind of do the same thing as a rumen, to hold that, those leaves in there. Now on the other hand, we have animals that decided that they wanted to leave their stomach alone and adjust and develop their, their large intestine. So animals like guinea pigs, rabbits, and koalas have a very large cecum. That's what this part is. And it's the same thing as our appendix. So you can tell that our appendix doesn't do a whole lot. But in these guys, they do a lot of digestion. So these animals will digest and it acts the same way as a rumen. It holds all those fibers and breaks it down over a time period. We also have animals that have developed in their colon. And these are most of our equids. So we've got horses on the left. Elephants are, are colonic fermenters, and actually humans are too. So these are different examples of uh, colonic development, but you can see it all has the same theory, that you have all these saculations that help hold the food and the fiber long enough for the animals to digest it. Now we all know about Carnivores, herbivores, and omnivores. We understand that carnivores eat uh, meat, herbivores eat grasses, and omnivores eat both. But a lot of people don't understand that there are lots of different differentiations of carnivores. So we have insectivores that eat insects. We have piscivores that eat fish. And my favorite one is the zoosuckivore, which <laughs> feeds on dying and decaying animal matter. Similarly, for herbivores, we have 
nothing goes to waste in nature. So everybody has something that they eat and use up of the plant. So we've got animals that eat leaves, which are called folivores. We've got frugivores, which feed on fruit, and nectivores that feed on nectar. So everything gets used and there is somebody who's going to eat it. Now, as I said earlier, sometimes we can use domestic species and what we know about all the research that's been done on them to help us decide how we're gonna make the diets for our species. And some of them are really easy. We can do a very easy extrapolation based on size, uh, but um, there are a lot of other animals that eat different kinds of, car of, of animal parts. So how does a cat relate to those kinds of animals that eat insects? Insects are very different than mice or rats. So they have a very different composition. So the animals that eat those animal, those insects have to have different nutritional requirements that we have to figure out. In the same vein, we have marine mammals that eat fish. Fish, again, are very different than mice and rats. And living in the water is very different than living on land. So they have different energy requirements. And then we have reptiles, which although they may eat the same things as cats, their metabolism and the way that their body works is very different. So we have to make changes. We can't use just the cat straight and blindly and pretend that that works for everybody. Similarly for ruminants, we can use a dairy cow as our model and it works really well if we just extrapolate to other ruminants. But again, what if we have we're taking a cow. Now, Holstein cows can weigh up to 1,500 pounds. A lot of people don't know that. And then how can we bring that down to a little diker that only weighs about 20 pounds? Or a, a giraffe, which although it weighs the same, has a very different diet. Cows are grazers, giraffe are browsers. They have different nutritional requirements. And then, of course, we get the little funky guys that are trying to be ruminants, and how can we actually use cows as a, as a model or not? We don't really know. And then because I like birds, I always include birds in this. We always, we have chickens. We know a lot, a lot, a lot about chickens, but it doesn't work when you're talking about a carnivorous bird. We actually have to use dog and cat requirements for carnivorous birds because they eat the same prey. Hence, they have very similar nutrient requirements. Animals that eat nectar, birds that eat nectar, are very different than chickens. That doesn't work at all. Similarly with it, birds that eat fruit. So there's a lot of unknowns. Even though we have a lot of research on domestic species, it doesn't really work for all of our exotics. So that's understanding what the species needs. Now we start getting down into what an individual animal needs. So we have to understand what their physiology is. Are they growing? Are they geriatric? Are they pregnant? All of those have different energy requirements and nutritional needs that have to be taken into consideration. With birds, it's important for egg laying that they get enough calcium. A lot of birds will what's called re-clutch. So if once their, their chicks have hatched, they'll lay another clutch of eggs. If they re-clutch multiple times and aren't getting enough calcium, their eggs get very soft and will break. And that's not what we want. So we have to make sure they get enough calcium for all the, the egg laying that they're doing. We have to understand the animal's health status. Now, I always do a disclaimer with this slide that that little prairie dog over there is not one of our animals. That's a very obese prairie dog. But that is something that we have to be considerate of. We don't want our animals to get obese, and that's one of the reasons we actually weigh our animals very regularly. That's one of the first things we train our animals to do because it's the least invasive way we have of checking to make sure their health status is good. So we have, we've had issues with diabetes in primates. A lot of older cats will, go, will have kidney failure, just like your domestic cats. Sometimes we have animals that don't have very good teeth. If they're recovering from a veterinary procedure or if they're sick, we have to make changes to the diet to make sure that they're getting everything so that they get better. We also have to consider their energy level. Our painted dogs and our puppies are very, very active. So they need a lot more food than, say, an animal that just is sedentary. 
which is not our orangutans, but this is a picture of a very obese orangutan who is very sedentary and they need a much different nutritional needs than um, the active animals. One thing I also have to take in consideration is that not only am I feeding my animals, but I have to, the keepers need to be able to use the food in a way that helps the animals. So we use, we work a lot with training. We try to make sure that the items that are used for training are just items that are in their diet. They don't get any extras. So we've had, we've worked really hard on that to make sure that our animals understand that they're going to get fed their diet to get to do the behaviors that um, we need them to do. Something a lot of people don't think about is social hierarchy. The most dominant animal is going to eat the best food, the most liked food. So we have to make sure that all the animals in the group get the proper diet in the proper amounts. One of the ways we do that is we spread the food out around the exhibit because the dominant animal can't be in six places at once. So that therefore the subordinate animals can get there. We also usually provide the most nutritious aspects of our diet behind the scenes and we separate the animals and hand feed them exactly what they're supposed to get. That way we ensure that everybody gets the proper amount of, of the diet. Sometimes in, uh, in zoos we have mixed species exhibits. So we have to make sure that either one, the diet ecology of each of the species is very, very different so they won't eat each other's foods. Or number two, that their diets are very similar so that it doesn't matter what we put out, it's okay for everybody to eat it. It's an interesting thing to look at when you see a mixed species exhibit to think about what these animals eat and who eats what. There are some species specific issues that you just kind of have to know. And one of them is that guinea pigs and all primates do not make vitamin C. So we have to have it in our diet. All other animals can make vitamin C. There are a couple species of birds that can't, but it's important that all primates, um, we have to have vitamin C while a lot of other animals don't. Another thing we have to take into consideration, especially for birds, is color and what they get out of the diet. This is from a zoo that I used to work at. This is called a carmine bee eater. And this is kind of what the bee eaters looked like when I first got there. We started a color additive to the diet. And although this isn't the same bird, this is how the birds started to turn out. And that's really important for breeding success. The females choose the males based on how robust they look. So it's something that you wouldn't think of for our diets can be really important for animals. Another primate species specific uh, issue is that these small little monkeys, marmosets and tamarins, have a vitamin D requirement that's about three times the amount of ours. So that's something that we've had to make adjustments to the diet and actually have a diet that is specially made just for marmosets that has a much higher vitamin D content than uh, the normal primate diets. The foods available that we have to look at are really important because they're very different than what the animals get in the wild. So I show you here, this is a wild fig. And if you look at it, it's very dry, it's got a very thick cuticle, and it just doesn't look very appetizing. But you compare that to what we've domesticated and what you see in the grocery store, it's very, very different. So we've domesticated our fruits to taste the way we want them, which means they're higher in sugar, they're higher in water, and they're lower in fiber. We like them to be sweet and juicy. But that's not what the animals eat in the wild. So what we usually do is for animals that are quote unquote fruit eaters in the wild, we actually feed them a lot more vegetables because the vegetables are more nutritionally accurate compared to what their wild diet is. We also use nutritionally complete diets. If you saw my, my bringing the zoo to you a couple weeks ago, we looked at different kinds of chows and different kinds of complete meat diets. And all those have the all the vitamins and minerals that the animals need and that's one of the things that I want my animals to eat the most of to make sure that they're healthy. We have lots of different kinds of foods available. I'm just 
going to scroll through this. We've got vegetables and for our herbivores. We've got prey items for our carnivores. We have lots of different kinds of hay. We have about four different kinds of hay here that we get in at tons at a time to be able to feed our animals. And they're all different for the different kinds of herbivores that we have. Now some considerations that we have to take into account with different types of animals and feeding strategies. For carnivores, a long, long time ago in the zoo field, we used to feed our carnivores just meat, like you would get from a store, a steak, ground beef, things like that. Well, that's not very nutritious for an animal that eats usually the whole prey item. It's missing the liver, it's missing the bones, it's missing all that, and we would have problems with our carnivores that they would uh, contract rickets and they would fracture their legs because they're not getting enough calcium and phosphorus. So we use a commercial product that has all the vitamins and minerals in it, but the one problem with that is it's a soft diet. It's a ground up diet, which is not healthy for their teeth. So every carnivore here, at least once a week, gets bones. Because our big cats, just like your domestic cats at home, do not eat raw hides. They don't like that kind of stuff. So we give them bones to help clean the tartar off their teeth to make sure that their teeth stay healthy. We do have commercial diets that um, some animals may not eat. This picture of a snake eating a little sausage is a little bit unusual. Um, usually they don't like that stuff and they want to eat the whole prey. The one thing we have to take into consideration with whole prey is that as the baby, we go from a baby to a juvenile to a small adult down to up to large adults, is the nutritional composition of that animal changes. If you feed your sm small snake a little bitty pinky, that animal's skeleton has not calcified yet. So you have to make sure you still supplement with calcium to make sure that your animal stays healthy. With fish eaters, most of our our piscivorous animals receive frozen fish, and the consideration we have to take into that is that most of the fish we purchase, we can only buy once a year. So it sits in our freezer for a year. I have to buy 80,000 pounds of herring at one time. So it's a lot, a lot of fish. And because fish are high in the omega fatty acids and the unsaturated fatty acids, they can break down over that time period. And so there are a couple nutrients that need to be supplemented to fish eating animals, and that's thiamine and vitamin E. If we did not supplement our, our animals with those, uh, we would see deficiencies within a few months. So what we do, and this includes our penguins as well, is we take the vitamins and we just stick it behind the gills and make sure that each animal gets that particular medicated vitamin fish. With insectivores, we have to be, again, cautious about calcium and phosphorus. This is a running theme here. Um, insects don't have skeletons. They have exoskeletons. And that does not have any calcium in it. So you can have, see in this chameleon, you can barely see its ribs. You can see that in its crest, it's very thin. Uh, so this animal has metabolic bone disease. What we do to try to counter that is we do something called gut loading. And what that means is right before we feed our crickets or mealworms to the animals, we feed those crickets a diet that's very high in calcium. So that way that diet is sitting in the cricket's stomach. And then when the predator eats the cricket, it gets all that calcium that's in the bug's stomach. So it's an easy way for us to be able to make sure that our animals get enough calcium. Bugs are the one things that we feed live, and one of those reasons is it helps stimulate the animals to eat because they see the movement, and it also makes them more active around their environment. One of the problems with the insects that we have or don't have is that we only have crickets and mealworms and waxworms and fly larvae, a lot of worms not a lot of beetles, not a lot of ants, not a lot of termites, which are huge food sources for animals, like our anteaters. Our anteaters can eat 10 to 20,000 ants and termites in a night. We can't provide that for them. So that's something that uh, we as nutritionists lament about sometimes is that we can't get some of the appropriate insects for our animals. For herbivores, we always have to take into 
consideration their size, their energetic, their energy needs, and making sure that their rumen stays healthy. If that rumen, if those bacteria in that rumen are not happy, our animal's gonna get sick. So we're actually feeding that those bacteria before we're actually feeding the animal because those animals, those bacteria need to be happy. In primates, one of the things we all we have to consider when we're making the diet is their psychological health. So we do a lot of things with the diets to make it more interesting for them to, to eat. Um, we vary the diet a lot to make sure that they're not eating the same thing every day. Um, we have to take special concern with our leaf feeding monkeys. Again, group feeding with social hierarchy and the, uh, uh, the opportunity for them to get obese. So again, that's not our animal, but it shows that they can get obese very quickly. Again, because I like birds, I like to put birds up here. So we have to facilitate the foraging strategy. Their beaks are made the way they are for a reason. So it's best for us to try to make sure that we give them their food in such a way that they can use their beaks in the way that it was intended. One of the things we have concerns about with a lot of our fruit eating birds is iron storage disease. So that's actually a project here that we've been working on with some of our birds for about nine years now, trying to improve getting chicks to survive to fledging and not making our other birds um, susceptible to the iron storage disease. Another thing that I have to take into account is formula. Every time we have a, a, a pregnant animal, we have to take the chance, we have to understand that there may be a chance that she might reject it. So we always have to be ready with different types of formula to be sure that we can make, take care of that baby. And again, just like their natural diets, animals' natural milk composition is very, very different between different species. So we've had to learn what, um, what their milk composition is. And then as I like to say, what about all the others? Well, those are ones that we have no clue. I don't envy the nutritionist of the Georgia Aquarium because she has a very difficult job trying to understand fish nutrition and getting them all the stuff that they need. The one thing I like to, to emphasize is that browse is really, really important. Like I said in my previous Bringing the Zoo to You, we've had a relationship with ComEd now for the last 10 years where they bring us the tree trimmings that they trim from around the power lines to bring them to us twice a week so that we can have all of this yummy browse for our animals. It's really, really important because it's a natural diet item. It keeps their GI tract healthy with all that good fiber. It keeps their teeth healthy because they're chewing on the sticks and uh, peeling the bark and things like that. And it, it in, in forces their natural foraging behavior. So then I just have some nice pictures of animals eating browse. So this is a copy eating some mulberry. We give it to our primates and to our antelope as well. It's kind of fun to watch the, the gorillas eat it because Jojo, our silverback, will take the branch and he'll just strip it of all the leaves and then eat that big mouthful of leaves. We can't forget our reptile friends, so we do give browse to all of our herbivorous reptiles. Also our kangaroos will get some good browse too. And with that, I hopefully will take some questions that you guys might have. Yes, so you said there's um, only a few true leaf-eating primates. Yeah. So why do we give browse to all of, the, all of them? We do give browse to all of them. Yeah. Um, all of our primates receive browse, um, and, and actually our leaf-eating monkeys, all, our Angolan colobus, will actually, I purchased browse from Florida during the winter to make sure that they have, they're one of the species, I only feed a couple species during the winter with browse that are vitally important for them to get it, because it, it's expensive to, to, to buy browse in the middle of December, so. How long does it take for you to develop a diet for a new animal? Um, it depends, but probably about, I mean, including looking at research behind that, it could probably take me a month or two. So I really have to prepare and know ahead of time if we're getting a new animal. Now, if it's the same species from a different institution, that does 
doesn't take quite as long, but we have to then uh, look at and examine the diet that they were re eating at their previous institution and see if it matches what I want them to eat at our institution. How often would you reevaluate an animal's diet? I try to do it in about a three year cycle because diets drift. You know, we make changes throughout those three years, and so I need to go back and say, okay, maybe we need to reset it back to what I want them to originally have. Uh, how many vendors do we use to supply the food? Oh my goodness, lots. It's really interesting because you don't think about cricket farmers, but we get 20,000 crickets a week, just us. So they have to be able to supply you know, PetSmart, Petco, other zoos. I can't even imagine how many crickets they have at their facility. But we have vendors for our meat. We have vendors for our complete meat, for our produce, for our chows, for our hay. We probably go through, we probably overall have at least 100 vendors. Do we have any local vendors? Do we try to shop locally? We try, yep, yeah, especially with our produce. The vendors that we use, we use produce companies and they outsource and try to use as many local vendors within about a 150, 200 mile radius um, for our use. Do we grow any food on the grounds? Unfortunately, no. We do, we do grow some browse in the greenhouses, but that's very, very limited. Um, unfortunately, we have looked at aquaponics and hydroponics and other ways that we might be able to, to grow some greens or some kinds of vegetables on site, but unfortunately the volume that we go through, we would decimate a hydropon uh, the hydroponic system would have to be huge to be able to support us on a daily basis. How are the large carnivores able to eat the bones? Well, they mostly just chew on the bones because these are big bones that we feed them. They're cow femurs, so they don't actually eat those bones. They'll eat the meat off of it. They'll eat the marrow from the inside. But when we do feed them whole prey items like rats and rabbits and things like that, they will eat the whole animal because those bones are a little bit smaller. Is any of our produce organic? Some but not all. Unfortunately, due to budget constraints and concerns with um, other kinds of, of situations that come from that, we don't feed the majority of our produce is not organic. What's your favorite diet to prepare? Oh my goodness. Um, I like the primate diets just because they're really varied. We really try very hard to make them very different. And of course, my spirit animal, the pangolins that we've been working with so hard here at, at Brookfield Zoo, um, they've really been a challenge, but it's been a fun challenge. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us for, for bringing the zoo to you today. I hope you learned something interesting, and we will see you tomorrow.